What's up, world? I'm Angelica Beener, and this is Milestones, a podcast where my special guests and I take a deep dive look into landmark albums that are celebrating a milestone year. Welcome to episode 11 of season two. I'm so glad that you're all here joining me. I'm really excited for this episode and even more excited to introduce my special guest. So let's get to it. All the way from Ferguson, Missouri, he is a trumpeter, composer, arranger, producer, vocalist, and activist, one of the most multidimensional and in-demand musicians of our time, working with everyone from D'Angelo to Rihanna, from Gregory Porter to Charles Tolliver and Common to Maxwell to Jay-Z. He is also the sound behind Don Cheadle's Miles Ahead portrayal of the iconic Miles Davis. His stunning sophomore album, The Magician, was released in 2017. He is an artist deeply rooted in the tradition of jazz and expresses it within the entire breadth of Black music. He is currently the creative advisor of Jazz St. Louis and he is an activist and community organizer deeply invested in the future of Black youth, both on and off the bandstand. He is here with me today to discuss another trumpet great, and that is the one and only NEA jazz master, Donald Byrd, whose work has profoundly impacted generations that followed his stylistic pioneering of R&B infused jazz. And this year marks the 50th anniversary of Byrd's era defining and breakthrough commercial success, Black Bird. Here to discuss this and more is the one and only Mr. Keon Harold. What's up, what's up, how are you, how are what's you? Up? What's up? I'm good. This is the late night edition of Milestones. <laughs> hey, it is what it is. We here. We're here so, for it. Yes, we are here. I'm really excited and I know you're really, really busy. And so I absolutely mean it when I say I appreciate your time. And in fact, you were just here in Brooklyn performing at the surprise celebration for Jay-Z and the Book of Hove, this summer uh, exhibition at the Brooklyn Public Library. And then I blinked and you were in Italy with your beautiful son. I blinked again, yes. you're in LA. <laughs> What's going on with you? <laughs> you know what, jet setting, moving around, you know, trying to take the music as many places as I can possibly go. But no, yeah, it was a, it was a beautiful time to celebrate Hove. Jay-Z for y'all, if you don't know, you know what I'm saying, right there on Eastern Parkway in, in, in Brooklyn. So it was a beautiful thing. Then I went to Italy to check out my son playing with the Berkeley School of Music, their summer program in, at, at Perugia, one of the most incredible jazz festivals out there. Yeah. So it, it, was, it was a good time. Yeah. How do you do it all? You're, you're everywhere. How hey. do you keep up? Mind over matter. <laughs> fair enough, fair if enough. There, if there's a will, there's a way, you know? Indeed, indeed. And so your last album, The Magician, which was an amazing album, came out in 2017. But I understand you have some new music coming. Is there anything that you can talk about yet? Yes, we have brand new music dropping at the top of August, which I'm super excited about. A new single that will be coming out on the Concord label, a song called Don't Lie featuring Malaya. So I'm mm. excited, excited about that. I haven't put out music in a long time. You know, we had a pandemic. We had a bunch of other things come in between my last release, but now it's time, not a better time. I've been, you know, working with a lot of different people, putting out things, but this is the first thing that I'm putting out in the universe to sell on you my know? own. Yes, with yeah. the Keon hair under your name. That's so yes. exciting. So that's the top of August on Concord. I cannot wait. That's really exciting. So I want to kind of go back just a little bit to your beginnings and talk about your formative years as a musician. You're from Ferguson, Missouri, grew up in a big family, including your amazing brother, Mr. Emmanuel Harold. Mm -hmm. But music was a big part of your family dynamic in some way. Absolutely. Uh, music kept us all together, kept us, you know, in constant communion, whether that be church, whether that be my grandfather sharing music with us, you know, from Count Basie Orchestra to Tito Puente to Quincy Jones to everybody else. We had to learn how to play and we had to be about it. That was just one of the things that we did as a family. Learn music. It was just a, you know, that was just one of the things. 
Wow. Um, it, it, was, it was always awesome from family reunion, you know, to sitting at the kitchen table, you know, beating on the table with my brothers. Always a good time. Wow. And who were some of your mm-hmm. earliest influences? Like, who were you checking out on records or cassettes or, you know, CDs or? In the most early sense, I would be listening to Cat Anderson from Duke Ellington's band. I'd be listening to Maynard Ferguson. Most people are like, what? When they hear me play? But he was definitely one of my biggest influences early on. And that changed to Lee Morgan and, you know, Clifford Brown and Booker Little and Fashion Navarro. Dizzy Gillespie and Wynton Marcellus and the great Roy Hargrove and Nicholas mm-hmm. Payton and, and and all of those guys. Anybody who really, you know, took the horn on a spin, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm listening to it, listening to the vibrations, listening to the improvisations, listening to how creatively they can put their band in motion. I'm always trying to just, you know, just trying to pick up the vibes. You know? So did you always know you wanted to play trumpet? Did you did you fool around with some other instruments first or you like you knew? You know what? I, I don't want to sound like a I don't know, like a I don't even know what I'd be sounding like, but there is a picture and I have to find it mm-hmm. uh, of me in the in the fifth grade being Louis Armstrong. That was like pretty much before I I was I, I knew how to play, but I wasn't serious about it. But they picked me to be Louis Armstrong. And, you know, from that, it was mm-hmm. just kind of like, I feel like it was kind of christened. You that, know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, I wanted to be a drummer. I'm still a closet drummer. Mm-hmm. You know, I produce a lot of music, but I wish I could could be the drummer. But the horn just came so natural to me. I played the viola. I played the violin, you know, and, you know put that away for a while. I always wanted to do music, but then, you know, I learned, I started learning the trumpet from probably the age of six to about, you know, 10. Then mm-hmm. I started playing baseball. I started, you know, doing sports and doing what kids do. So I put that away for a while, but, you know, around fifth, sixth grade, the horn came back to me and it was just kind of like, it's, it's never left my, my, my hand since then. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. And then, so, you know, we also know want, I also yeah, wanted yeah. to be, a, I wanted to be a soprano singer. <laughs> really? Wow. <laughs> well, you know, we're going to get into the fact that you actually can sing. And the first time I found out, I was like, wait a minute, that's cute. <laughs> singing. And it tripped me out. But yeah. so I want to ask you, because, you know, we all know you went to the new school here in New York City, but I never knew what high school did you go to? I went to McClure High School in Ferguson, which is, a, you know, suburb of St. Louis. Mm. Um, yeah, it was a very, very public high school. There was music <laughs> There was music there, but you pretty much had to be on your own <laughs> when it came to it. But it was crazy that the amount of talent that actually came through that school that came up in Ferguson. You know, we think about Marcus Baylor of the Baylor Project. You think about Mark Kohlenberg, who played, you know, with, with Robert Glass before a very long time, and Q-Tip and so many others in common. And then we think of the legendary Michael McDonald went to my school. Get which out is the of here. Mo- what? Seriously. We're on the Wall of Fame together. So I, I, I'll, I'll take that, you know. One of the I most love soul- Michael McDonald. One of the He's most soulful. Ferguson? Yes. Yes mind blown I did not know that yeah I did not know that so yeah. this school you went to although it was a a very public school and we know that in our generation that's when they started taking instruments out of the schools but mm-hmm. you're saying from what I'm getting that you had a robust sort of education there I mean you had to be, to get into the new school right I mean I pretty much I'll be honest with you the the first two years I did band, but after that I took it as independent study because it wasn't really challenging me in that way. And at the time I was I was you know I was really practicing. I was on you know kind of on a mission myself. Going my my learning was actually going to sit in, you know, with 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 the legends of St. Louis's guy named Willie Aikens and mm-hmm. um, P. T. Williams some amazing musicians in St. Louis led by this guy, Richard Henderson, who was an avid record collector where I would go to his house, you know, late on the 
in the evenings on on the weekends and he would just make me tapes this is before cds anything he make tapes <laughs> of clifford tape. yeah pretty much of clifford brown of book of little of, of of everybody and his prerequisite was you can take whatever you want but i'm gonna put three ballads on these tapes and you're mm. gonna have to learn have to learn these ballads because you youngsters ain't playing ballads no more and it's all about you know you got to be able to you got to you know you got to have that sauce that's what the ladies like you that's know right that's right and, you know so exactly. yeah yeah people like Richard Richard Henderson you know was a champion which I learned so much just by hearing him and I went to this went to another school called a Central Vision Performing Art School, aka VAP, where I met, which is which was a performing art school. I met Jamal Nichols, who plays with Greg Reporter right now. Jeremy Clemens, you know, was around New York for a very long time. We had a, a jazz band called the Young Jazz Messengers at one time. <laughs> but you know, just just my my colleagues, I went to that school because the school I went to didn't have like a, a crazy jazz band or anything like that. So I went to VAP where it was a lot of youngsters or, you know, similar to my age and we were all learning, trying to figure it out, you know? Mm, that's a yeah. really interesting path because it wasn't just one lane. It sounds like you had, you used really the, the sort of fertile soil of your community. That's amazing. Absolutely. So I want to ask you, because we talked about for, for, you know, especially for Black folks, our entree into playing this music is sometimes the church or other institutions, but academic institutions that are responsible for teaching the music to students have largely failed Black people. I want to read to you this Times article. And then I'm really, really interested in what you have to say about it as someone who did go to the new school. So it says, of the more than 500 students who graduate from American universities with jazz degrees each year, less than 10% are Black, according to the Department of Education statistics compiled by Data USA. And it said that in 2017, which was the last year that this data was available, only 1% of jazz degree grads were black women. And I think this is really startling, especially as we start to segue into talking about Donald Byrd and his legacy in academia. You know what I mean? In addition to being one of the finest musicians we've ever known, but this is somebody who had all these degrees and PhDs and you know moved to New York, got his master's at Manhattan School, taught at Howard, developed their first jazz program. Howard didn't even have a jazz program. And so I'm really interested to know if you felt these disparities in, you know, on the university level, like, and, I mean, and if you did, like, how did you, how did you navigate that? Hmm. That's very interesting. And to hear that is basically, it's just describing what I saw. And I went, you know, in 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, where, you know, there's not that many females, but let alone not that many, you know, females of color and men of color or people of color. It's just not that many going to school for, for jazz. And, you know, I was lucky, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, I went at, at, at a time that, that, that there were a few, but the size of the school versus the amount of black people that were there is, is, is minuscule. Mm. And I would say most of the people of color who were coming there kind of already knew what was going on. So whether you finished or not, because I know a lot of them didn't even finish. It was just, okay, let me go and just check this out. And it's like, okay, I'm out, I'm out on the road. Mm. I'm out, I'm going to become an artist right now. So the idea of the education was more a formality than it was actually you know being there fortunately mm -hmm. i i finished <laughs> i finished you know but that's really sad and i actually hate to hear that because there's so much talent there's so much creativity that's not fostered the way it should be so you know i hope that number changes yeah. um, you know yeah um, for sure man. you know i think about the work that you do your outreach you're very much a, a big, you know, 
star in your own right, but I see your moves and I see you taking time out to make sure that you, this next generation is taken care of. And so, you know, when I did read that, it made me just appreciate it that much more what you're doing, because I had no idea that I knew it was a crazy imbalance, but less than 10%. I mean, that's crazy to me, but you went to school with the Strickland brothers and Glasper and all these other people. So like how, so I get, and Bilal, right? Bilal was there mm -hmm. when you were there? Bilal was there before I got there. And after that, he, you know, got his deal and moved on. But gotcha. the, the in the community, absolutely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I yeah. guess in a way that helped you bond too, because it wasn't, but so many of you. Like, right. Right. Wow. I mean, I mean, the bonding happened because it was very much like-minded people. Musically, you know, you can be sitting in the hallway and you can hear somebody playing some Wayne Shorter, you know, and you'd be learning about the records. Let's learn about the soothsayer. Somebody's playing and it's like, what is that? Is that Freddie? Is that Tony? Is that, you know, who's that? Is that Herbie? Who, who's who's playing right now? Is that McCoy? What, what What's going on? Mm -hmm. And we were sharing and cracking jokes and learning and living life and just being there. For, and, you know, after that, go get something to eat and then do a jam session and jam all night which was, you know, a beautiful thing. Georgia Ann Muldrow, Lakeisha Benjamin. I'm glad, really happy to see what she's doing, the splash she's making right now. Yeah. And, and and so many other, you know, people. It was just a, a good time. But again, when you think about it, it was a good time, but it wasn't that many people because I can count them all and I can tell you all of their names in spite of, you know, all of the classes that came through when I was there, mm. you know. Not to mention, you know, who's actually still doing it. It's very mm -hmm. few. Wow. 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 Okay. So you're from Ferguson slash St. Louis. Can we throw that in there? St. Yeah, Louis. of course. Yes. Okay. Of course. And, and and so I wonder with there being so many amazing trumpet players, there's a there's a legacy of trumpet where you come from. When did Donald Byrd sort of come into your consciousness? Man, Donald Byrd, when I was, one of the first records is John Coltrane, Lush Life. You know, hearing him play over Lush Life, hearing him play just that beautiful, fluffy, airy, you know, just graceful sound. And just hearing how he slid around the chords and, you know, his, his approach is just, just beautiful like a paintbrush actually mm. that's the first time i kind of heard him but just listening to all all the classic records Gosh. you know that solo is one of my favorite solos. really oh yeah i know oh yeah wow. I, I won't do it now because it's late but <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> i know that whole solo oh my gosh it's gorgeous yeah that that's 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 a special special moment right there. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow, wow, wow. I oh, that's so cool to know that. And yeah. it's crazy because if we're talking about Donald Bird, I could ask you was the first time you heard him, but then it's also like what era because there's his hard bop era, and then mm -hmm. um, it started gradually changing. You know, ch changing. It was shifting. It was moving. It was developing mm -hmm. into into something else you know like you talked about Coltrane and then you know Messengers Max Roach Gigi Grice and those early 60s records and then it, it kind of I feel like there's like a parallel with you and and Donald Byrd in uh -huh. that way for real because you know your first album introducing Keon Harrell which came out in 2009 it was a pretty solid jazz record I mean yeah. it had it had hints of what else where we were going, going? where we yeah. were going you know but you really established yourself as a serious jazz player first and then eight nine years later by the time we get to the magician you know more of the fullness of you know what you love to do is there yeah. and there's also this social commentary right so like what we know that there's all this wonderful stuff about Ferguson, but I think the world knows about Ferguson 
for a much different reason. Yeah, the, the situation you, that yeah, the situation yeah. that that happened with Mike Brown, you know, shook the world much like the thing that happened with George Floyd. It just made people really have a look at the system and a look at themselves, you know, coming from a place like that and knowing what the system, what the what the um, temperature of the system is and was at the time growing up, it was, you know, it wasn't even shocking to me. Um, it was shocking to the world because everybody else had to see it and know about it. And, ex- and, ex- and experience it. But, you know, as a as a Black man growing up or Black young man growing up at that time, I really didn't know many of my friends who weren't, for some reason, arrested for something, which mm. which usually ended up nothing. Right. But it was, it was just being in the wrong place at the wrong time quite often. And that's, you know, just literally driving down the street, you know. So, that's unfortunate. And I mean, so much so that the Department of Justice had really did, you know, a, a thorough analyzation of it. And it showed systemically how bad it was. So we're not crazy. Thank <laughs> you. you. Know? Exactly. So, so which is which is unfortunate. Yeah. You know, thankfully, they are making lots of strides to to make it better. Obviously, we just got to keep pushing it and keep mm-hmm. putting the social issues on Front Street. And it's important. As an artist, I'm a person who definitely wears it on my sleeve. You know, the 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 way I see the world is, is you know, that's that's I have a platform to actually speak about it. So if I can creatively get a message out there and help people look at something that they've never seen or either grow from something that they've always known, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm down to be that person. Was Mike Brown's death sort of a catalyst for it in a way as in terms of like really making it a big part of your artistry, would you say? No, I don't think so. I just think that was, that was something else that added to it, Mm. added fuel. You know, I've always, been a person i'm an empath so when i see something i got to say something i'm an empath if i see something i want to do something about it i want to you know create some kind of so i want to create a movement so we can bring about change Mm -hmm. you know ultimately and music just happens to be my platform of doing it whether i was just an actor or i don't know a garbage man really wouldn't matter to me i Mm -hmm. want people to 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 you know, I want, I want, I want fairness. I want freedom, you know, mm-hmm. you know, so. Yeah. 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 Wow. 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 Well, I want to segue into a little bit about, I want to segue into some of the work that you've done. I don't want to say outside of jazz because I hate these boxes, but you know what <laughs> I mean, for lack of a better mm. term. You know, I remember when you were playing with Maxwell. Yeah. That was when, you know, we had little boys that were shorter than us. Indeed. We <laughs> actually had baby boys. We had baby boys. And you know, you were playing beautifully and you were singing. I mean, when so can you talk a little bit about how your your development as an artist and when you started working with the Jay-Z's and the Maxwell's and stuff like that. How did that kind of come about? Mm -hmm. Interesting enough for me, I wanted to be the next quintet leader, you know, thinking about my predecessors, Roy Hargrove, Russell Gunn, Nicholas Payton, you know, them guys leading, you know, great quintets and, and Winter Marsalis, it was just always like, you know, as a trumpet player, you think of Freddie Hubbard leading his band, Clifford Brown leading his band. And it was just like, I wanted to do that. But my first professional gig was playing with Common. So that changed everything about that being the normal for me. So, you know, I, I started working with Common and learned about Hugh Massey Caleb, you know, which was not something that, you know, you necessarily, that's not in the in the canon of trumpet players you should listen to, you know, pedagogically in, in school. You right. know, I, I didn't learn about that at the new school. Not that it wasn't there. I just never heard it, you know. So that opened me up to so many other things, so many other ways, you know, 
So my development was, you know, going there and realizing that the trumpet doesn't go on every song. So what do you what do you what are you gonna do when you when 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 you're not playing? Are you dancing? Are you the hype man? Are you singing? Are you you know trying to you know playing keys or doing what what else can you do to bring energy to this show? You know mm-hmm. that was that was the first part. The second part was basically being you know let go of the gig when the new album didn't have much trumpet on it. Mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and like, okay so what do you do for me it was start producing mm-hmm. so the next time it comes around I'll be the person who's you know creating music with the artist versus just being the trumpet player so that it that actually grew me from what seemingly could have been tragic to me mm-hmm. it was something that helped me grow you know in in a major way and you know you brought it up earlier um about the the parallels between <laughs> thank you for making yes. this uh, parallel i, I see you're very uh, uncomfortable with that. Of, of 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 a donald bird the the legend the goat it's you know i like all kind of music i've been inspired by all kind of music for as long as i live you know jazz was not the first music that i listened to you know, my 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 parents were in the ministry. My sisters love R and B. My brothers love hip hop. You know, the 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 early days of hip hop. You know, mm-hmm. all the way up to the nineties. You know, so all of that stuff was always on the radio. Jazz was later. You know, so my development was basically being able to learn how to fuse all of those things because the hardest thing is hearing some music where somebody kind of knows. A little bit about something, but not quite. And it's like you 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 miss the boat, or you're trying too hard. It's not authentic. So for me, for me making a record in 20, 2009, which I had just pretty much gotten off the road with Jay Z, and mm. I just went to the studio and recorded that record. Never toured it. Never really did anything with it. I was just kind of figuring out what my production meant to what my jazz is. I didn't know yet. I was trying to I, I was trying to put those things together to where to where my the way I write forms in jazz makes sense. Where I put the vocals makes sense. How I have the beat versus the harmony. How does that make sense? How does my improvisations go over that? So it took me a long time to figure out how that all worked. And by the time I got to the musician, you know. I produced music for 50 Cent, produced music for LL and Queen Latifah and, you know, Lloyd Banks and everybody else. And and it was very cool. But, I, you know, it was like, but how do you take all of that? Because I don't want to just do that and not bring that into the music that I'm actually, you know, I'm performing. I'm the artist in. So I wanted to put all that together and it took a long time. And I'm happy that I finally figured out my vibe. Yes. You know? Yes. Oh, that yeah. is incredible. That is an incredible journey. I yeah. I didn't know that's how that went. That's oh my gosh. Yeah. That that is brilliant. And I I want to ask you because in you know in 1973, which is when this album came out 50 years ago this year. 50 years ago. Crazy. crazy. <laughs> Yeah, it was a huge album. It was Blue Note's biggest album to date at that point. It had sold hundreds of thousands of copies, you know, in, in the first year it was a huge, huge, huge commercial success. Top 100, top, top you 100. know, billboard. Yeah, yeah. And no. it resonated with the black audience. Right. Mm-hmm. And I want to ask you, because it seems like Whenever there is jazz music that resonates with the Black audience, or when it, when there's a strong resonance with the Black audience, I should say, there's this criticism from, I guess, critics and journalists and, and folks who say that it's watered down, it's selling out, it's, you know, going this other route. And there was this veiled racism to me that's underneath that because it's like, okay, so because it's resonating with black people, mm-hmm. it's not, it ain't the real deal. It's, it's right, right. But, you know, and we're talking 50 years ago and the critics said, 
I mean, brutal things about Donald Burr when this was happening, right? And 50 years later, there's still some remnants of this. And I would love to know, first of all, your thoughts on, you know, Bird's decision to do that. And maybe, you know, how that, how that re- helped you in your own artistry, but also like, do you get backlash? Hmm. Well, <laughs> you know what? I, I talk about the first thing first. Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel that music today wouldn't be the same if he didn't take take the 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 daring chances that he took to make a blackbird because before it it wasn't it wasn't normal to to do that and actually be cool the way he went about it was 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 so cool i mean he went and and worked with motown producers like you know the stuff that was on the radio, the guitarist from from Marvin Gaye. It's it's kind of like you go and get that person and you play music that doesn't really have it has lyrics, but not many. Mm-hmm. The, the music is actually carrying the songs, the beautiful music, the soulful sounds, the the sound that the easy. I think maybe one of the things they they call it is easy listening music. Right. You know what I'm saying? But go ahead and try to play it yourself and see what see and and, and see what happens. The the music is is such a vibe and such a visceral feeling of freedom that people can't really take that if you don't really understand what the story is. So I think Donald Byrd jumping off into the deep end was 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 courageous and that for you know for that time resonates now it changed the music for so many people all the samples that came from that record making incredible incredible new music when i hear the music that i'm i'm trying to put out you know Mm -hmm. that that is basically quote unquote tough for people to categorize when i listen to that album and i listen to some of the freddie hubbard records around that time you know it's it's kind of like you 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 telling me that that's not jazz and that's something else? Are you telling me that I'm not able to, you know, have very few lyrics, but lyrics, but very few and not call it jazz? Or if there's lyrics on it, it's not jazz. Mm-hmm. You know, all, all of these little boxes that are created for people to, to simply express themselves. But, you know, oddly enough, if somebody else did it, it'd be genius. It'd be cra- It'd be amazing. It'd be, exactly. oh my God, you, you hopped out, you hopped out of the box and nobody really could, you know, keep you, you know, keep you, keep, keep you tied up. You know, you mm-hmm. did. But for him, you know, me seeing that lets me take the chances that I want to take musically. And, you know, I applaud him for that. I'm actually, you know, I used to see Donald in the hallway at the new school. Unfortunately, I never got a lesson with him, which is crazy. And I'm, you know, that's that's definitely one of my my regrets in college, seeing Donald Bird walk around daily and not getting a lesson with him. That's you know, crazy. You know. But did you ever like just just rap with him a little bit or just just not n- not not in the deepest sense, you know, yeah. just just very briefly. Yeah. You know, in passing, you know. But the um, music to your point. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now I was just going to say, but the music itself, like that was the biggest conversation and lesson. It sounds like to me, like the way you just broke that down, you know. Absolutely. Is, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you brought up Motown producers. <laughs> and of course we're talking about the legendary Mizell brothers yes sir who worked on this Larry and Fonz Mizell and they I mean this was the first record that they worked with them on and it's funny you brought up Marvin Gaye I'll shift for a second. so this album right this album came out in 2019 I think yeah the, during the pandemic or right, right. before it, I exactly. remember yes and I was like, oh, snap, where are we going from Blackbird? I didn't know that Marvin Gaye recorded it like first. So wow. I guess what happened was Marvin was supposed to do it after what's going on. And then Marvin kind of got really in his head after what's going on. I guess he felt like I'm at the top and there's nowhere to go but down. And he kind of was 
hmm. psyching himself out. It was a really weird artistic time for him. So they shelved this record. Wow. But Donald Burr ends up doing it. I think the same with, there's a song on another Donald Burr album that I think originally was for Marvin Gaye. And hmm. it's to your brilliant point that this music was, it was funky, it was soul, it was it was Detroit, it was it was Motown and and it was also jazz. It was it was interpreted in Donald Byrd's way and also the singing. I mean, I know there's Louis Armstrong who's the pinnacle, but were there other trumpet players who were singing like that before Donald Byrd? I mean, at post mm -hmm. Armstrong, but but pre-Byrd? Mm, not not in that way. I don't think so. Yeah. Not 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 that I know of. Mm -hmm. You know. So did that inspire you, your your me me me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean for sure, for mm -hmm. sure, for sure. Freddie was playing Stevie Wonder covers and stuff like that, and Red Clay. But it seemed like Donald Byrd caught like the worst of the criticism. Like, mm -hmm. wh why do you think that might be, or do I have that wrong? I mean, it had to be because so people get nostalgic, you know, people, people don't want the, the, the new version of somebody. People want what they can touch, what they can hold on to. So, you know, a person who, who, who loves, you know, Donald Byrd and, you know, and, you know, playing, you know, him burning out, him, him, him playing, you know, straight ahead. They're nostalgic to see him play with electronic instruments, to see him, you know, being funky and stuff like that. It's, it's like, what are you like? What are you doing? You mess you, like why? Mm -hmm. You know, but it's it, it's really unfortunate that people would look at him, you know, and critique his artistry because, again, this move, this music needs to move. And if it doesn't move, it dies. It turns into museum stuff. And the fact that he had the foresight to push for it and to trust his vision and to say, you know what, let me get with the people who are really moving the world right now and those Motown producers, that in itself was, that's a revolution. And most people aren't ready for revolution in whatever sense of the word that is, mm. you know, whether that be, whether that was, you know, whether that be politically, whether that be socially, whether that be musically, nobody's really ready to take that plunge. You got to have absolute courage to to move forward and donald bird was definitely you know <laughs> you know the pentacle in that kind of you know in in shifting music and shifting things forward you mm. know? that's such a brilliant takeaway and it reminds me of the fact that something that we don't talk about enough and that is when you talk about innovation moving the music forward, the essentialness of, of music moving forward, and Donald Byrd really mentoring Herbie. You yes, know what indeed. I mean? Like, like yeah. you know, I'm, I'm a Bronx proud girl. So, you know, when Donald Byrd was living in the Bronx and when Herbie as a kid came to New York, you know, living in the Bronx together. And yeah, I heard a few of those stories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And just, you know, the fact that he was so influential. I think that's Herbie's first recording is on a Donald Byrd album. And Donald was always kind of trying to push him to move forward. And I mean, if we want to talk about innovators who have pushed the music forward, Herbie's usually the, the first person we think of. He's kind of like the poster person for that. And I'm not saying without good reason, but it's also to your point, it, it makes sense that the person who's behind him is a Donald Byrd. Mm hmm. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I heard, you know, <laughs> heard me tell a story about, about Donald Byrd, about the time that he got the call to go play with Miles, you know? Really? Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So, you know, interesting, <laughs> interesting, interesting. Funny yeah. story, but I'm not going to tell it, though. Yeah, I was going to say but, 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 but it's awesome. It's incredible. And it makes it 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 literally, you know, is it kind of it's it's like a sub context to this whole conversation. You know, you gotta you you gotta be able to, you know, hear and see change to actually implement it. 
you know, mm. you know, what, you know, maybe what the conversation that they were having were, you know, next level that, you know, Donald moved, Herbie moved, they all were moving together. But the idea of the, you know, the, the vision was planted, you mm -hmm. know, you know, those two, those two incredible minds. And they, again, when you think about the, the best, I don't want to say the best, maybe that's not the right word, the most influential albums out there, you know, they both have them, especially that, that really shifted the way we look at music, whether the way we, us moving into hip hop, the way we, you know, I don't know, the way we see music, man, mm -hmm. it's, it's so, so, so incredible. When you said they both have that, it makes me think of that the the track on Blackbird slop 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 jar blues. Slop, oh my slop. god, sitting on the slop jar, <laughs> waiting on my bows to move. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. But the crazy part is, in all of that funkiness and all of that music, it was still the blues. It's and never, the blues. It's never, the blues. never, 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 never lost sight of the blues. Exactly, because you know? Headhunters comes out that year. Blackbird comes out that year. And when I hear Slop Jar, the, that sort of the bass answering, the you know, it, it's very Watermelon Man-ish to me. Absolutely. Like those two songs kind of could like mm -hmm. go together in a way. Do you have a favorite song on this album? That actually might be it. It might be it, yeah. Yeah. It's a Blackbird. I mean, just the whole thing. And, and again, this, out, like, this project, it's not really like favorites it's like i like the project right you know? and yeah. it's it, it's an it's an album and you know for me as an artist i i aspire to do music in that way to mm -hmm. where it's it's like i appreciate the project not just the one song even though i can pick my favorites but the the album doesn't really make sense to me if i even thought about it as one song it's the whole the whole thing mm -hmm. uh, no, that yeah. makes that makes total sense. And you, you know, you were talking about samples. There's that iconic DJ premiere sample from Flight Time that he uses on New York State of Mind. Just that that beep, beep, beep. And then, you know, the song Sky High, which was actually the name of the Mizell Brothers production company at the time. There's something when you were talking about that easy listening sound that isn't so easy, right? And I think about like when I was a little, don't laugh, but I like, I used to watch the prices, right? You know, you were home from sick. Your mama mm -hmm. was watching the prices, right? Absolutely. And I used to love those music cues. They were so good. Like they they're were so, amazing. They're freaking amazing. 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 Yo, I yeah. have them. I have like a file. I'm going to send it to you. Please share. It. Thank I'm you. That'd be great. Yes. It's like 30 of them. They're okay. so good. But when I listen to them, it's like I hear where they got it from. You know, mm -hmm. I hear where they where they what they were going for, those, those, those mm -hmm. TV arrangers and stuff. And I feel mm -hmm. like it's right out of this 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 sound right here, you know, because it oh, was you know, heavy on the melody, but gorgeous, you know, changes and and flutes and Oh my God! The flute on it, on this record is just amazing. It's just just perfect. Mm -hmm. just perfect. Yeah. I mean, listening to this record, you know, with my son, it was just you know the first thing he he thought of is man, that kind of reminds me of some some old Isaac Hayes kind of you know just the vibe. I'm like, yeah, you right in there, you right, right in there, son. That's 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 exactly what it is. He nailed it you because know. it when I think of Isaac Hayes. And film, I think black exploitation, and this album yeah. literally sounds like that. You know the the black exploitation stuff. So he he hit the nail on the head with that. Nah, yeah, nah. I said, oh, yeah, you're right, son. It's got ears. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. I guess I would just want to end by asking you what the most important, I mean, and, and not even the most, but what what part of Donald Byrd's legacy do you? feel like speaking about when it comes to the way it has reverberated over generations um hmm. what's your biggest takeaway from his legacy 
I guess my biggest takeaway from Donald Byrd and what he's left us is more of a idea that it's okay to reach. It's okay to, you know, to go the traditional route, but it's okay and actually important to push farther than that and to to trust the vision. Just to see his incredible legacy from the from the mid 50s all the way until he passed away to to continually put out legendary albums legendary music high content high vibe high influence by just being honest so i think his legacy speaks to honesty it speaks to i mean him doing going through the whole process with education is special because he was one of the one of the first, one of the to to just say I'm gonna I'm gonna go all the way and do PhD and do this whole thing. You can count the people who who really did that, but at the same time, be a real artist, not necessarily just a teacher. He's the he's the artist, he's the teacher, he's the producer, he's the 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 improviser, the um, innovator. He's all of those things. So I feel like his legacy is just you know one that everybody aspires to to be it's, it's i'll speak for myself it's it's what i aspire to be as a as a creative to be an artist to be a teacher to be a an activist to to actually also leave some kind of a iconic work that other people will be studying 50 years later at least mm-hmm. so you know I'm so thankful for 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 Donald Byrd, his sound, his his love for the music, his his ability to bring up the next greats from Herbie Hancock to so many other people. What he left is just something that we can all be proud of. It's something I can be proud of. I speak for myself. I keep going in, you know, going in in the in the in the basic sense, you know. But for me, he's a hero of mine as a trumpet player, as a producer, as a writer, as a you know, as somebody who preaches, you know, music first. You know, mm-hmm. I'm on, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on the, I'm, on, I'm in the congregation of Donald Byrd. Ooh, I love that. That is so beautiful. I, I can't let you go without just briefly touching on the fact that this album was like the starting place. For, I mean, just hit after hit after hit after this with the Mizell brothers from places and spaces, so stepping into tomorrow, falling like dominoes, wind parade, like all mm. that stuff. Like, I, I really love you. Dun, dun, dun. Boom, boom, boom. You know, I do. Let's do. Hey. Yeah. And don't. it's like, I, yeah. Yeah. And I guess while, while Miles, like with with bitches brew and stuff like that, was going more of I guess in a rock direction, it was like you, Donald Byrd was playing stuff for like the skate rinks and the skate parks and the. He was he was he was playing for the people. Mm. Donald Byrd was playing for the people. Yeah. No. For sure. No. Yeah. Miles wasn't using no lyrics. He wasn't using vocals at all. Not at that time. Mm-hmm. You know. Hmm. No, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You know, Donald Byrd, 50 years ago, Donald Byrd released this, you know, phenomenal, quintessential work, Blackbird, that really has changed the game for so many people. It changed the game for music from every sense, from jazz sense, from funk sense, from hip hop sense, to how we look at music. Donald Byrd, 50 years ago, took took a chance that mm. was that was for the best for all of us. So we celebrate that now, 50 years later. I love it. That is so beautiful. Keon Harold, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. I am so honored and it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Your mind is just, I love your mind as, as much as uh. I love um the music that comes from that mind so (laughs) do you want to tell the people where they can find you or any of that good stuff angelica beaner it's always an incredible time talking to you seeing your face and just building on music because that's how we met it's it's all about the music the high vibrations so you know 
it, it's been incredible to talk about one of my favorite trumpet players and Donald Byrd. You know, for all of the people out there, you can follow me at Keon Harold. I have new music coming very, very soon. I'll be at the Blue Note August 16th. So come out and be doing a special project then. I'll be in New York City. I'm not living there anymore, but it's cool. I get the chance to come home very, very, very soon. And I'm looking forward to seeing some of y'all there in the building. Also, again, look for the new music that I'll be dropping early August. You know, there it is. I can't wait for the third and the 16th. I'm going to, I'm going to definitely be in the building, man. I got to, I got to be there. Me and Riley got to be in the house. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes. I love you, my bro. Love you too, my sis. Yes. And I'll see you soon. All right. Cool. Okay.